Good morning, everybody. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you're joining us for the first time today, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And for today's program, we are going on a fantastic adventure together. If you've been joining us over the last few weeks, we have been on this epic Cross Canada virtual road trip in partnership with our friends at Parks Canada and the amazing education team at Canadian Geographic. All the past programs are on our YouTube channel. If you want to see us go up to Innovit for raptors, go out to the West Coast, the East Coast. We've done everything from archaeology to amazing animals and so, so much more. But for today's program, it is particularly special because it's unlike anything we have ever done. Today, we are here to tell you the story of how the forts were fed. These sites are very different. One's a fur trading fort from the 1840s, the other a military fort from the 1900s. But each site shared the same purpose, to protect and house the people inside it. Part of providing for the traders and soldiers was making sure that everyone in the community had enough to eat. But this could be a challenge. Here today, we have some interpreters who will share stories of yummy recipes from 100 years apart that you can make at home. These recipes show us that even though we are divided by time and the ocean, the lives of people living in these areas are not so different after all. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our friend Joe, clad in traditional attire, to dive in with Flavors of the Forts. Hey Joe, welcome in, man. Hey Jesse, how's it going today? Fantastic. So nice to have you here and so excited to excite our kids. This is so fun. Awesome. Hello, bonjour, everyone. My name's Joe, and I'm coming to you live from Fort Langley National Historic Site here on the unceded territories of the Coast Salish and Stalo peoples, the Kwantlen, the Keitsi, the Matsqui, and the Semiamu. Now, one of my favorite questions to ask people that visit me at my fort here is how many soldiers do you think were stationed at Fort Langley? This is a trick question because there were absolutely no soldiers stationed at Fort Langley. Zip, zero, none. This place was not built for fighting. This is a trading post built by the Hudson's Bay Company for trade. Now, we're called a fort because we're fortified. We have a big, strong wall all the way around this place called a palisade and sturdy watchtowers called bastions that overlook the Fraser River, traditionally called the Stalo. And the people that lived along the river that traded with our fort or call themselves Stalo to this day. This place was built for protection. They had to protect the fort and the trading post inside because when Fort Langley was built, this place wasn't a colony yet. There was no soldiers, there were no police to call if this fort was attacked. And they were more actually concerned about attacks from the United States at that time. There wasn't really much fear from the local First Nations people. They were really eager to trade with our fort. And so while things weren't always perfect, it was mostly an amicable relationship between the local people and our fort. Now, what's really interesting about this place is it was built for fur trading, but far and away, the money from our fort came from food. This place started around the end of the fur trade in the 1800s. Fort Langley was built in 1840 on this location. And because of that, they weren't doing a lot of fur trading. Also, the local economy is based mostly on fish. We're on a river full of salmon. One of the best salmon runs in the world runs in the Fraser River or historically has. So we were getting lots of salmon in trade from local First Nations people, also lots of cranberries in trade. And these would have been packed in barrels made in our cooperage here at Fort Langley and shipped to markets all around the world. We're strategically placed on the Pacific coast to be part of a trade network that goes all the way around the world, all through the Pacific Ocean, connecting forts here on the Pacific Northwest coast to other British colonies in places like Asia and Africa and even the Caribbean in the Atlantic Ocean. So it's pretty amazing to see these connections. Also, Fort Langley had a very, very productive farm here. Some of the best agricultural land in Canada is found here in the Fraser Valley and the Hudson's Bay Company that built Fort Langley recognized this and turned a huge prairie south of our fort that had been actually made by the local First Nations people to cultivate a root vegetable called camas into a huge farm that they grew all sorts of produce here. Root vegetables, you had a lot of livestock, cattle, pigs, goats, sheep, all sorts of animals kept here, but they were growing lots of potatoes too. Dry goods, but potatoes more than anything. Really good growing conditions for potatoes here. So with all this food available, while it might seem like a remote trading post like Fort Langley, when it was first established, this was about as far away from Britain as you could be. 
you'd think that the pickings would be pretty slim here, that there wouldn't be very good food available. But really, there was. Being on the shipping lane here, we had a lot of stuff arriving. People had access to all sorts of delicious spices. We had cinnamon and clove and nutmeg and mace available to the workers here. Chocolate, even lemons grown in a greenhouse just south of the border. And what's Vancouver, Washington today, that used to be called Fort Vancouver. And it was a Hudson's Bay Company post a long time ago. They had a greenhouse down there where they were growing all sorts of great stuff, including lemons. We make all kinds of delicious stuff here at the fort. We have a heritage oven that we use. I can show you some pictures of it right now. I'm just going to share my screen really quickly and show you a couple photos of our oven here. Here we go. This is a picture of our bake oven. So this is the traditional oven that we use here at Fort Langley. Got another great photo I can show you here of my friend Antoine making stuff in this oven. Now, this oven here, you have to get hot very early. It takes about three hours to get up to temperature. So I'm going to stop sharing this photo and I'm going to share one more with you. My friend Antoine here. I'm, I'm glad ovens still don't take three hours because my lunch will be ruined. It's just not Me good. Me too, man. Yeah. <laughs> We've improved. <laughs> so this is my friend Antoine, who is truly a wizard with this oven. You can see some of the delicious stuff he's made, sourdough loaves and muffins. You can make all sorts of great stuff. He sometimes makes lemon scones and people ask him, where would they have gotten those lemons? Well, I just told you, down at Fort Vancouver. So amazing stuff can be made in this oven. All sorts of food was available to the workers here, including things like these delicious biscuits that I made just yesterday in the oven. So these are some cranberry bannock biscuits. I've shared the recipe with Jesse so he could share it with you guys. It's very fun. You can make it at home in your own oven. You don't need a wood fire traditional oven to make these bannocks. Bannock is a Scottish name for kind of trail bread. And a lot of folks who live in places like Manitoba, I know we have some friends here from the prairies, from Eastern Canada, bannock was a staple food in the fur trade. A lot of people really liked eating bannock. These ones have dried cranberries in them. I mentioned we got cranberries in trade from the local First Nations people here. To this day, cranberries are an important cash crop here in the Fraser Valley. So they would be used to enliven things like the bannock biscuits that you might find on the table of the bosses in our big house here made by our steward. We had a special servant who cooked for the bosses here called the steward of the fort. But also you might see this on the tables of the workers here too. They're delicious, really, really fun to eat. Mm. Now I know my friends over at Fort Rod, here I am speaking with my mouth full, have had some leaner times in the history. They're going to talk to you about some times when forts were struggling a little bit harder to feed themselves. So I'm going to pass it off to my friends over at Fort Rod. Hello, bonjour, everyone. My name is Emily, and this is my friend Ashley here. We are heritage presenters with Parks Canada. So, haishka, merci, and thank you for joining us here today. We are at Fort Rod Hill National Historic Site uh, at the mouth of Esquimalt Harbor on the traditional territories of the Songhees and Esquimalt nations. So Fort Rod Hill was built as a military site in the Victorian era, so way back in the 1890s, to protect the colony of British Columbia from threats by sea. So throughout its history, the guns of Fort Rod Hill have looked out over the Pacific Ocean, ready to fire at enemy ships. While this site never actually saw active war, it was ready and armed during World War I and World War II with troops of soldiers living and working here on site. Uh, so we are standing just outside the canteen building. You can see behind us here. This is where soldiers who trained at this site could come to eat their food and spend some leisure time when they weren't doing their drills and training. Uh, today, Ashley and I are both dressed in, uh, in the World War II uniform, such as like the soldiers would have been wearing here on site. Um, just like Fort Langley, our site does have tall walls around it to protect from gunfire, but instead of protecting fur traders, our fort was protecting the coast from enemy fire. Something else that we have in common with Fort Langley is the soldiers who lived here got hungry. Feeding an army during wartime was not easy, and the government actually called on civilians to help. 
to make sure that both soldiers and citizens had enough to eat, the government introduced something called food rationing. Now, food rationing is when the government restricts how much of something you can buy at one time to make sure that everyone gets a fair share. In Canada, we ration sugar, butter, meat, coffee and tea, and even alcohol. The food that we saved was then sent overseas to our servicemen and women fighting abroad and to British citizens who were faring far worse than us Canadians. Here at Fort Rod Hill, there are as many as 250 soldiers training and working during the World Wars. And just like you and me, all these soldiers got hungry. When they wanted a snack, they could come down here to the canteen to buy things like chocolate, soda, pickled eggs, and beer. But what about their main meals? It took creativity and teamwork to endure the rationing period. And to feed a fort full of soldiers, it took imagination and resourcefulness. This grocery bag we have here is full of typical items that you would find here on Vancouver Island in 1943, right in the middle of World War II. Let's take a look what's inside. So as Ashley mentioned, ingredients like sugar, uh, tea, and meat were rationed during the war, since so many resources were dedicated to the war effort. People used little booklets, like the one Ashley's going to show you here, uh, and they were called ration coupon booklets. So these were very important. When you went to the till to pay for your food at the grocery store, you also had to hand over some coupons to make sure you were only taking as much food as you needed. Even though if you had the ration coupons and the money to pay for your food, it wasn't always guaranteed that the food would be on the shelf every week. So you had to be very careful with how you used your ingredients. Meat was an important source of protein for many people during the war um, and a way to ensure that you were getting your protein intake while still adhering to rationing was to make meat into loaves or uh, cakes. So in many recipe books from back in this era, you can find meatloaf, sausage loaf, things like that. And in these recipes, uh, you would mince up your meat really finely and then to stretch it out, make it last as long as possible, you would add something like rolled oats to help uh, make more, more bang for your buck. Soldiers here were lucky because they were stationed right by the ocean. So they could get their own source of protein. Things like clams, mussels, oysters gathered from the mud and rocks at Fort Rod Hills Beach. Uh, it could be turned into a delicious chowder. And then salmon and rockfish uh, could be caught in the nearby harbor and then turned into your main course. There was even a small farm here on site uh, with dairy cows, pigs, turkeys, uh, things like that to help the fort be more self-sufficient. Vegetables were also an important part of your meal, just as they are today. And many Canadians ended up growing what they called victory gardens. And these were just gardens in their own yard that uh, could help them ensure that they were getting a fresh supply of vegetables like carrots, lettuce, potatoes, all that good stuff uh, during the war when things were sparse. But the best part of any meal is truly dessert. So we're going to talk about that now. And this is where you had to get creative in the ration kitchen. Fruits like apples, peaches, and cherries are commonly grown here in British Columbia, or cranberries like Joe talked about. And we even have some apple trees here on site still. Cooked apples add the perfect amount of sweetness to recipes and are still used in baking today. For soldiers and civilians with a sweet tooth, a popular recipe to use was a ration cake, which avoided using many rationed items and used other creative ingredients you could find in the kitchen. Remember, common baking ingredients like butter, and eggs and sugar and milk were difficult to get a hold of. Each person was allowed only one cup of sugar and one stick of butter a week. So you can imagine that it was only on special occasions that you got delicious baked goods. Now here's where the creativity comes in. It became common practice to substitute milk, eggs, sugar, and butter with other easily found ingredients. For example, you could swap sugar with the syrup from canned fruits. Or if you're feeling extra adventurous, you could swap milk and eggs for a can of tomato soup. That's right, tomato soup. Believe it or not, tomato soup can make a rich, sweet cake without any of the tomato flavor. And it would also allow you to make a cake without using all of your dairy and sugar. Now, Emily and I are gonna put this to the test for you. To make this cake, you would start with your one cup of sugar, which uses all of your sugar rations for one week. So this would be a very special cake. 
Now there's no eggs or milk in this cake and very little butter. Eggs would be difficult to get um, unless you had your own chickens and same with milk if you had your own cows. Now, thankfully, we can actually use baking soda instead of milk and eggs to make the cake light and fluffy. So the two tablespoons of butter that we have here is gonna be more than enough. The tomato soup adds to the creamy texture while also giving the cake some sweet tanginess. So what you would do, uh, I, Jesse has shared all of these recipes with you guys. So you can try this at home, go bake it with your parents or an adult in your life. You're gonna cream together your one cup of sugar and your two tablespoons of butter, mix it all up nice and good. And then all of your dry ingredients you'll mix together. So we have two cups of flour here. And then some of the spices that Joe was talking about earlier, we have one table or teaspoon each of clove, nutmeg, and cinnamon. And then to make it all nice and fluffy, you're going to add your baking soda and your salt. So once you've mixed that all together, you'll pour it into a greased baking pan, an 8x4 baking pan, and bake for one hour at 350 degrees. Now, Emily and I have already baked our cake. So this is what the finished product looks like. It doesn't look like tomatoes, does it? We're going to try this later and we'll let you know how it goes. <laughs> So as you can see, even though we are sharing recipes from 100 years apart, uh, Joe from back in the 1840s and us here from the 1940s, these recipes are still made today. And though times have changed and we have more food available to us, lots of fresh veggies all year round, cooking using what you have on hand uh, in your fridge, in your pantry, it really helps you to cut down on food waste, it helps the environment, and it reminds us of the delicious ways that people were fed in both of these forts throughout history. So these two recipes show us that even though the stories of Fort Langley and Fort Rod Hill happened in very different times and uh, slightly different spaces, um, the lives of the people living in these forts was not so different after all, and maybe not so different from your life too, because after all, everyone has to eat. Alrighty, so thank you very much for joining us and we're really excited to take your questions now. Ashley, Emily, I'll bring back in Joe as well. What a spectacular program. I love the outfits, I love the recipes and indeed all our registered classes. There's 70 groups across North America. We will get you all those recipes so you can do them at home. In fact, it might be a really cool thing that you can do as part of the Canadian Geographic Contest, which will link into you guys as well. So just a, an extra special opportunity for your classrooms. By the way, that was the first in over 2,000 broadcasts we've done to ever be bombed by Canadian geese. So that was very exciting for us. Uh, never happened in our history. And and uh, it's frankly been too long, it's been seven years. Uh, guys, we're gonna dive in with questions. We've got a bunch of live groups with us, which is fantastic. Our YouTube friends, if you wanna share questions in the chat, please do. And actually, we've got a couple already. So Joe, this first one's for you. Uh, you mentioned the root vegetable of the First Nations in the area park. What was that again? They wanted to make sure for their class. Absolutely. So that root vegetable is called camas. My friends at Fort Rod can talk about it because there's actually a species at risk program managed by Parks Canada that does some work on it there. But I can speak a bit about it as well. Yeah, sure. um, it's a traditional root vegetable that was grown in prairies that were actually created using controlled birds. So controlled use of fire by the local First Nation people. It's really interesting. It's, the buzzing is probably in the background for me. I have a, a friend from the maintenance department doing some lawn maintenance right now with some Maybe. rather uh, My apartment's being reno too. This is half the fun of video broadcast. We've got a lawnmower, we got Canadian yeah. geese, we got uh, buzzing in the apartment. I'll turn my mic down. You're good. Sorry, guys. Hey, all good. So yeah, it's it's a root vegetable called camas that is grown in prairies that are created through controlled burning. So the First Nations people would use fire to open up the rainforest canopy and create space for camas to grow. Kind of an interesting thing that happened is when Europeans arrived, these ready-made openings in the canopy of the rainforest made for great places to build forts, farms, develop towns. So where modern day Victoria is, a lot of what is modern day Victoria was once a camas meadow. And same like with Langley, city of Langley, south of here, and a lot of the Fraser Valley around here, some of that space was opened up using fire to grow camas by the local First Nations people. And it was kind of co-opted when Europeans came here and colonized the area. Very cool. Ashley, Emily, do you want to speak a little bit about the other side of the, the coin? 
Or is sure. that it? <laughs> we have a lot of camas on site here. Our site specifically for Red Hill and Fiskard Lighthouse, we actually have one full acre of um, Gary Oak Meadow. And so it was reclaimed just from kind of field. And that's where we grow a ton of camas. Um, and so like Joe was saying, it's a root vegetable. Um, I've had it myself, actually. And it kind of tastes like a mix between a potato and an onion, I would say. It's kind of sweet, but it's also very starchy. Um, yeah, very, um, very, very popular uh, in this area, specifically in Gary Oak ecosystems. Um, if you're ever uh, out here on the island, be sure to come and walk through the Gary Oak Meadows during May. You'll see the, the bright purple flowers and they're super, super beautiful. Very cool. Potato and onion sounds like a lovely combo. I wouldn't have to mix them together. It's like right there for me. Uh, let's head to Miss Lawson's group. Two threes joining us in Lethbridge, Alberta today. If you guys have a question, come on, mute your mic, and uh, come on in. All our live classes, I'm going to come to you one by one now. Miss Lawson's group, welcome in, guys. Let's see. Hello. 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 Say hi. Hello, Cameras are here, guys. Hi, hi. Do you have a question for our interpreters today? Does anybody have a question? Everyone. Great. What's the question? Mm -hmm. I got darn it, I forgot. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> it's okay, Gray. We can come back in a minute if you figure it out, Gray, okay? okay. We'll come right back, man. We'll come and check in. Let's head to Miss Coffin's Group 3 Fours in Gory, Ontario. You guys have one for us? Come on in. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Um, how many people would be living in the forts? Ooh, okay. <laughs> Ashley, Emily, I'm going to come to you first for this one, and then we'll head to Joe as a, a right next. How many folks? Um, so there were up to 250 soldiers at a time that would be stationed here at Fort Rod Hill. So that means that they were living here on site. They were training here on site. Um, when it wasn't active wartime, we had much fewer soldiers here. But during the height of World War One, World War II, 250 was around the number that you would have here at Fort Rod. Perfect. Thank you. Joe, how about you? That's a really interesting question. Fort Langley, it varies depending on when we're talking about kind of like at Fort Rod. When the fort was established, it was a little over a dozen Hudson's Bay Company workers, all men that built this place. But at the height of operations in 1858, there was a gold rush that happened on the Fraser River. So they really had to beef up the amount of workers here. We had about 50 Hudson's Bay Company workers here at that time. But a Hudson's Bay Company policy is they only hired single men. And they did that because a lot of the First Nations communities here in Canada make trade through links of marriage. So they would marry the workers into the local First Nations community. And those men would have kids with those wives. So we had about 150 people living in Fort Langley at the height of operations. 50 Hudson's Bay Company workers and the other 100 were their families and kids. Very, very cool. I love the context, you guys. Uh, let's head to our grade threes, Miss Greaves class, Manawaki in Quebec. Unmute your mic and you are good to go. Hey, guys, Woodland School. Hi. 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 I'm just asking, where did all the food come from? Ooh, okay. Uh, Joe will come to you first for this one. Where is the food coming from for this, the fort? Most of the food here at the fort would have been grown here, produced here, or traded to us from local First Nations people. River full of fish here that's got salmon, massive sturgeon, huge fish that can get up to almost 20 feet long in that river, as well as little oily fish called oolakin. Those would have all been traded to the fort here, as well as cranberries, and then the potatoes, livestock, all that grown on the farm. But we were getting stuff like those spices and chocolate and things like that that would have been shipped from far away. Places like England, places in Asia, like in India, China, and also a lot of places from the Caribbean. The men got a rum ration here every week, and that rum was Caribbean rum. It was the Navy kind of rum, but that's what they were drinking here. Joe, I love the answer and how animated you became with the chocolate. I still feel that way. Honestly, whenever I go to the store, there's a bunch of chocolate there. I'm, I'm, I'm so happy. It's beyond measure. I'm a chocoholic. Fully, fully <laughs> Ashley and Emily, the food at your fort, did it come from the same sort of thing, grown on site? Kind of. Maybe not so much grown on site, but there was definitely things that the soldiers could forage for, if you will. So they would go to the beach and they would dig up clams and mussels and even oysters if they were lucky. Other things would be shipped into the site from um, 
pretty much from just from the military, they would send things over here. We also actually had a farm that was just up the road. And sometimes the soldiers would go there and trade things for ice cream because the farm had a dairy oh, cow and they would make really yummy ice cream. Yes. See, I can, I've been putting in the banners with all the spelling of things, and I just want to put yum for ice cream. There was that fish that Joe mentioned that I don't even want to try and spell, so we're just going to leave that, we're going to leave that under the surface. <laughs> uh, fantastic. Thanks, ladies. All right. Uh, Abdi and Miss Wilson's class, welcome in, Abdi. They're joining us today in Hamilton, right down the road from where I am. Grade three wants to know how they built the oven. So, Joe, the special oven you showed us, how do they make that? How does that even come to fruition? So that oven was built as a partnership. Actually, the oven we use was built by the Army Corps of Engineers today. And kind of interestingly, when they proclaimed the colony at Fort Langley, that's one of our big claims to fame. They proclaimed the colony of British Columbia here. There were royal engineers, kind of like the Army Corps of Engineers came through at that time to start building the colony. But that oven is built out of bricks and the outside is covered in kind of concrete. And in that day, they would have used mud brick and then probably smeared the outside with mud. It's very, very good at holding in heat. Once that oven is heated up it, and you put a solid wood door on the front, you soak it in wood so the, the soak the wood in water so it doesn't catch fire when it's on the door, it really holds in the heat. In fact, it's probably still about 100 degrees in that oven from when I was baking in it yesterday. Wow, how cool is that? Uh, a lesson for our kids, though. Don't coat your oven in your house of mud. We're going to stick with the old timey ovens for that sort of thing. Whoa. Okay, perfect. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Joe, for putting the name of the fish. So there's our fish name, which I would never have guessed in a hundred years. I would not have won that spelling bee contest that they do every year. Uh, very, very cool. All right, YouTube classes. You guys are so on the ball, I love it. I'm coming back to all our live groups in a minute. We are whipping through this Q&A, which is fantastic. But let's head to Miss Babbitt's class, grade two threes in Toronto. They wanna to know how you kept the food from spoiling. Do you have a way to keep it cold? So Ashley, Emily, I'll come to you guys first. How do we keep the food from spoiling in the 1940s? So there was a couple of ways that you could do that. Oh, we have some geese flying by. Hold on one moment. <laughs> the best, they're the best. Um, hazards. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> there were a couple of ways on site here that you could uh, keep things cool. So, or keep things from spoiling. One of them was we actually had a cellar underneath the canteen here. And that was uh, the perfect location underground, underneath the canteen. Um, it would keep your, well, a lot of beer mostly, <laughs> <laughs> nice and cold and uh, crisp and ready for drinking. But another popular way of keeping food from spoiling during this era was canning your food. So you would get a lot of your food in cans or it would be dried. Uh, and then you would have to either rehydrate it, open the can, and then cook from there. Fantastic. And then Joe, quite a bit earlier. What's the deal? Same sort of deal or different? Little different. <laughs> Canning didn't exist when this place was built. So a lot of the food that might spoil, stuff like the fish, the salmon, would have been packed in barrels with salt. They would have salted the salmon and actually topped up the barrels with a salt brine. So it would almost be like pickled in the barrel because you want to keep the barrel wet so it stays watertight. The wetness inside the barrel keeps the wood of the barrel, the pieces in the sides swelled up so they hold together real tight. Salmon was a major trade item here and that's how they would have preserved it. Um, if you want to learn about canning, that's kind of the next evolution in salmon here in BC. A really great place to visit is called the Gulf of Georgia Cannery. It's another national historic site here and a really great place to learn more about the history of salmon in BC and salmon fishing. Very, very cool. Thank you, Joe. You guys do the best segues between this whole program. This has been so much fun. Um, Miss Lawson's class, I'm going to come to you guys for two straight now because I know we, we skipped the one at the beginning. So let's make sure we get two questions from you guys. Uh, come on in and take us away. Hey, Leftbridge. Do you have a query for us? Come on mute and you'll be good to go. Yes. Hi. Hello. Hello. All right. So we have a question. Um, thought, please. Um, who was the like first person or people to um, to embark in the forts or? Ooh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When did these the 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 west or where did they come from? Great question, Joe. I'll head to you first for this one. First people at the fort. So first people of the fort was a small group of Hudson's Bay men who came up from Fort Vancouver down in what's Vancouver, Washington today. The border wasn't really set when they built this place. So it was kind of like a combined disputed territory shared between the United States and Britain. And they came up here to set up a trading post to try to 
fend off American fur traders that were trading with the local First Nations people here. The first man who set up this place was a man by the name of James McMillan. James McMillan was the first boss of Fort Langley and actually the Kwantlen First Nation, who are the main trading partner of our fort, their modern day reservation is on McMillan Island, named for James McMillan, just across the river from us here at Fort Langley. Very cool. I think that's a great uh, like sign of success when they name islands after you. I think that's my <laughs> goal. We'll see how it goes in education. Uh, Ashley Emily, first person at the fort there or first group? Yeah, so we didn't have just one person. We had a group of people. So it was actually a military group, a British military group called the Royal Marine Artilleries or the RMA. So they came here. They saw the strategic area of the site, especially with the Navy base that is just across the harbor. And they decided that this would be the perfect spot for a fort. So they actually built it. Uh, in the 1890s, this building right here, the canteen was built in 1900, and they didn't give the fort uh, over to the Canadians until 1906. Fantastic. See, I'm answering questions from YouTube as well, not just the first people, but exactly when they were built, so I appreciate that. Um, Miss Lawson's class, we'll come back to you for one. We'll go to our live groups, take a few from YouTube, so hold tight, everybody. I am coming. Uh, but Lethbridge, take us away with another. Um, another question? Hmm. So how many First Nation groups were involved? Fantastic. All right. Uh, Ashley, Emily, I will come to you guys first for this one. We're going to alternate. I keep you guys on your toes. Uh, First Nations groups involved for Rod Hill or none? So the area that the fort is built on is the traditional territory of the Songhees and Esquimalt nations. So part of the Lekwungen speaking peoples here on Southern Vancouver Island. Um, they were not necessarily involved with the building of the fort, but this is their traditional territory here. Outstanding. Joe? Hey, yeah. Fort Langley is on the territory of numerous First Nations. I named four of them in my presentation. The Kwantlen, the Keitsi, the Matsqui, and the Semiamu. Coast Salish and Stalo people speak kind of a shared language. There's three dialects here, Hulkamalam, Hunkaminam, Hulkaminam. There, there's different names for it, different dialects. But where I live in Abbotsford, just upriver, I'm on Sumac territory up there. There's many First Nations who shared and used this territory for thousands of years before this place was ever established. Yeah. This has been one of the overarching themes of our entire cross-country virtual road trip. So again, for all our classes, if you want to check this out, go back through our litany of programs. They're all on our YouTube channel. And one resource that we found has been really effective for students across the country in finding out who lived on that land for those thousands of years, nativeland.ca. I really encourage people to check that out. It's a fantastic resource. And of course, if you want to find out the native communities that lived on the site of current national historic sites or national parks, you can find that on all their websites and certainly in their interpretive centers on site if you get the chance to go in person. All right, let's head to our Manawaki crew. Uh, Ms. Kaufman, I will come back to you guys in a second, but Quebec, you guys are lining up. I love it. Uh, come on in. Hey, guys. Hi. Um what would they do if they were running out of food and they would get hungry even though they ate food? Yeah, this is a great question. And actually, one of our other folks on YouTube wanted to know how and if they were able to stay healthy. So in Ms. Wilson's class, today wanted to know as well. So if you start running out of food, what do you do? Joe, I'll come to you first for this one. Here, if you're running out of food, you go to the forest. You go to the forest or you go to the river. There's lots of fish you can fish from the river, but sometimes a year there's no fish running in that river, especially in wintertime. That's when people are often trying to fish for big fish like sturgeon. That's the fish you're going to find in the river. So the river is a good source of food, but also the Hudson's Bay Company sent men out to hunt and forage. They would trap for beaver. They would hunt for deer and bear. They would find food any way they could. Fantastic. Joe, I don't know. We'll ask you next time we come to you, which you prefer, chocolate or the epic sturgeon? Because I think your level of enthusiasm is about equal for both. Right? We'll come to figure that out together. Uh, Ashley, Emily, what happens if they run out of food? <laughs> Yeah, that's an, an excellent question. And that's pretty much the whole point of rationing, right? You don't want anyone to run out of food. So you take what you have and you divide it up evenly so that everyone gets some. That's why the military had rations, right? So each soldier would get a specific amount of food so that they didn't go hungry and that they could stay healthy. Yep. I'm really happy we've spent so much of this program talking about rationing, talking about some of the challenges of getting and procuring food. I think a lot of us in Canada and the United States today in our audience, we're very used to going to the grocery store and having unlimited amounts of every kind of food in the world. And that really isn't the case for most people living alive today and certainly wasn't the case for pretty much anyone uh, 100 years ago. So I, I think it's really important that we're emphasizing that today. 
Uh, let's head to Ms. Kaufman's class, Gory, and then we'll head to a few more YouTube questions. We are like, this is like the best Q&A of all time. You guys are so lucky today. Ms. Kaufman's group, come on in. Hey, guys. Hi. Hi. Um, so we've been talking a lot about the food. So Riker has a question about... What do you drink? What do you drink? Perfect. Okay, so what are we drinking at the Fords? I know we've talked about a few of these things so far throughout the program. Uh, Ashley, Emily, I'll come to you first. That is a great question. So uh, obviously the soldiers would be drinking lots of water. You want to stay hydrated, especially if you're training really hard and doing lots of drills. Um, but something that's kind of fun is that when uh, Parks Canada workers were doing archaeology work around the canteen here, they found lots of soda bottles, beer bottles, all those sorts of things. So those would have been the items that the soldiers would have been drinking here at the canteen when they were having a fun night off of um, training. Uh, things like ginger ale, cola, all those sorts of good things. Ginger ale, incidentally, is the best drink to have on planes. Next time you get on a flight, anyone, ginger ale, is, it just rocks. It's the best. It just suits it so well. Um, let's head to Joe. Yeah. Um, oh, Joe, for repeating the question, what do they drink at the forts? I know the lawnmower is a little loud for you. So uh, we're talking about food a lot. What are they having as a, a beverage? And unmute. Sorry, Joe. Unmute your mic. It had to happen. It has to happen every broadcast. It's very important. Sorry, Ben. I think I missed that again. Can you just repeat that real oh, quick yeah, one more time? Worry. I was just asking, uh, what did they drink? We talked about food a lot. What were they drinking at the forts? Drinking at the fort. Great question. So they would mostly drink water here. Uh, they, they, they were doing a lot of hard work and they needed to hydrate themselves. So they drink a lot of water. But I also mentioned rum. Rum was a ration the men would be given. And they would often drink something very similar to what you would see on sailing ships, kind of like grog where they would mix their rum with water and then mix citrus in it, whatever citrus they could get, lime juice, lemon juice, maybe from those places down at, at Fort Vancouver, help fight off scurvy, keep their vitamin C levels up, keep them healthy. I was gonna say, what better way to fight off scurvy? That's fantastic. Uh, let's head to Ms. Gale's group. I love this question. So for Ashley and Emily, uh, you talked about the alcohol. Is it for drinking? Is it for sanitizer for soldiers' wounds? Do they did they waste any on sanitizer for soldiers' wounds, or was it just for drinking? What's the what's the deal? <laughs> Mostly for drinking. I uh, I it was very precious at that time too, so I don't think they would have been wasting it on sanitizing. They were drinking it. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I think we're in this modern era, and we're so used to sanitizer now, especially over the last two years. But that's something. If you got wounded, you're you're open for the best at that point, I suppose. Um, let's take a couple more from YouTube. We are almost done, folks. Time flies, and you're having fun. We've had so many questions. It's great. Uh, let's see. Take one from YouTube. So many from Miss Wilson's class. Ooh, okay. We talked to, oh, Jaden wants to know. I love this question. How do you know all this stuff? I always love questions for interpreters about these roles. So Joe, I'll come to you first. Like, how do you get all this knowledge? It's quite spectacular. I do a lot of reading. So whenever we have downtime, sometimes we have quiet days here in the winter. And I, we have a great library here that I get to pull books from. And I do a lot of reading to kind of build it up. But I also do a lot of listening. We're really lucky to work with a lot of First Nations elders here who have traditional knowledge they share with us. So I try to listen as much as I'm reading and talking. As an interpreter, I do a lot of talking. So it's important to stop talking sometimes and open my ears up and listen. I, I find I, I'm with you. I talk a great deal, probably too much for any 10 people, but it, bookshelves are the best. For any of our students today, head to your library in your school, in your public library. Uh, you'll never find a better resource of people or actual resources uh, in your life. Ashley, Emily, same deal as it, as it libraries and listening that helps you guys get all this knowledge. Definitely, for sure. We also have a really amazing archive here on site with original documents from when the site was active as a military fort. So we have a lot of firsthand history there, too, as well as photographs um, of soldiers here at the canteen and what they were eating and drinking. And as I mentioned earlier, archaeology, too. Um, they the, a lot of their garbage ended up outside the canteen, essentially. So we found all of their bottles. We know exactly what kinds of pops and uh, what kinds of beer they were drinking. Fantastic. How neat is all this? Uh, we're going to take one more live question, guys, and then we'll wrap up from there. Manawaki and Quebec, you guys have been right at the camera the whole time. I love it. So come on back in Woodland School and wrap us up with one final question. Did food ever make them sick? Ooh, okay. Any bad foods? Okay, Ashley, Emily, I'll come to you guys first. Bad foods at the, the fort there? Hopefully That's not. That's a great question. 
Yeah. yeah, there probably there were definitely times that they would get sick, especially, you know, maybe if they were digging up clams that might, you know, have been sitting in the sun too long, they definitely could have gotten sick. Just like you and I can get food poisoning, they absolutely got it back then too. <laughs> Joe, I assume the same deal a little earlier in the historical record too. <laughs> yeah, honestly, I haven't seen anything in the records of the fort. We have journals from those days where a lot of interesting stuff was recovered. I haven't seen any records of food poisoning, but I can almost guarantee that absolutely that would have been a problem here. They didn't have fridges. Salt isn't the best way to preserve food. So food would definitely spoil it. I'm sure people got sick every once in a while from eating bad food. Here. Yeah, it's pretty much been a human universal since the dawn of time. So I, I love the question, guys. I love the, the wide ranging level of enthusiasm from all of you today. This has been such a special program. I want to note before we bring back our friends to say a big thank you and farewell to, uh, if you guys want to learn more about these incredible forts, Fort Langley National Historic Site of Canada and Fort Rod Hill National Historic Site as well, uh, just incredible places. Check out their websites. We'll make sure you have those links at the end of the broadcast. And for our two recipes, I can't encourage you enough. If you guys want to make cranberry bannock biscuits at home or with your classroom or the tomato soup cake that Ashley and Emily share with us, we will get you those recipes. We'd love to see you guys make those as a group. And you can even submit what you do and, and talk about it and share it as part of the amazing Canadian Geographic Education Contest that we've got on the go for the entire Cross Canada virtual road trip. So I hope you take the opportunity to do that. And thank you all so much for being here for such a fun program today. But before we wrap up, we're going to bring back Joe. We're going to bring back Ashley and Emily. Thank you all so much for investing and putting so much into this program. It's been honestly one of my very favorite programs I've done in a very long time. And I love this whole series. It's so much fun. Uh, but you guys are great. And uh, we're going to bring in, I know, Ashley, Emily, you've done this before. Joe, you're new to this. But we wrap up every program by bringing in all our kids to say a big thank you and farewell. So Miss Lawson's class, Miss Kaufman's class, and our Woodland School in Manawaki, thank you all so much for being here. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.